to thank each of you, clients and friends, and for many of you, your first exposure to PBSI to today's really important webinar. We're going to talk about ransomware, best tools for effective defense. Um, I want to say, even though we'll talk about tools PBSI uses for clients, the goal of all of these webinars, and today in particular, is not to sell products and services, it's to inform. And uh, hopefully that will happen today. Certainly, a lot of what I talk about today will be either repeat knowledge or old news. And if you're a PBSI client, other than a small number of things you may take away, uh, if we're supplying your security, we have already implemented uh, most all of the tools that you'll see today. And in a lot of cases, we've already implemented all of the tools you'll see in place today. And I'll make clear where that may or may not be the case. So if you're a PBSI client, um, we work hard to make sure you're protected. So this is important to understand where are our risks. And so today we'll just do a short discussion about recent security events, um, where do breaches most frequently succeed, because it's kind of important to understand that, what are the essentials of preventing ransomware and being able to recover, and some best practices unrelated um, at the end. So that's a simple agenda. And uh, thank you for your attendance. For those not familiar with PBSI, we provide technology services and security services for uh, healthcare business, nonprofit, professional firms in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. And <clears throat> one thing that if you've been to a PBSI webinar before, you've heard me say repeatedly, I am blessed as CEO knowing that 75% of our staff have been with us for 10 years or more. Now we train and we learn, we're a learning organization, but I know that knowledgeable people help clients. Very thankful for our staff and those of you who use PBSI for support. Um, I've talked to many of you and I know you feel the same way. So our goal is proactive security monitoring among other IT services. So recent events. Uh, it's no surprise to anyone attending that ransomware has been in the news. The hugely publicized attacks in the meatpacking and <clears throat> oil transport industry and many others, <clears throat> pardon me, even very recently, and I'll talk about just a few of those, uh, email hacks also are increasing rapidly. I'm guessing that many of you, like me, this year could hardly count on one or two hands the number of times you've received what you know to be a bad email with an invoice attachment or a purchase order attachment from somebody who you know and you're on their contact list. That has resulted from an email hack. Uh, we see this more and more and uh, we'll talk about the key things to prevent damage from occurring from these attacks, but they're dangerous. We need to be aware, we need to know how to protect. Malware is transforming many times now with each iteration. So thousand companies are attacked today, there may be a thousand different variants from the same vendor. And uh, this is because the electronically morph attacks, which leads to the proliferation of zero day attacks or zero days, meaning we have zero days to prepare for them. And a traditional antivirus software, uh, whether at the firewall or at the desktop, can't always recognize a bad piece of malware in advance because uh, it's never been seen before. So this makes security difficult, but it really highlights one thing I want to make sure and be really clear about today, and that is that modern security must be multi-layered. We can't depend on the firewall protections we put in place to succeed 100% of the time. We can't depend on the server protections. We must have desktop antivirus or EDR software in place because if an attack gets through layer one, layer two, you have to have an end uh, piece of software that does what it can to mitigate, delete, quarantine. So multi-layer is really an important concept. So recently, uh, it's now almost old news, although it's been uh, fairly recent in the news, that the SolarWinds Orion attack uh, caused attacks at many large organizations and governmental organizations, and the fact is, even in the highest levels of the security industry, there is not certainty, one, that there aren't four organizations that have been attacked, and two, 
that the attacks have been completely eradicated, such was the um, advanced uh, nature of the attack. But one of the key takeaways to me is that many of the tools sold to security developers were uh, included in the SolarWinds attack. And you see the list of names here that may be unfamiliar completely, JetBrains, TeamCity, and so forth. These are subcomponents of attacks that were used in the SolarWinds attack, but also they're independently sold. And just one of them, a company called JetBrains, is used by 79 out of the Fortune 100, and it was founded by three Russian engineers in the Czech Republic, and security firms have built that software in. Now, actually, that software, that company is probably very legitimate. There's no reason to think that they're a bad actor, but simply they were uh, sub-attacked and their software used inside of SolarWinds. So just this month, CVS just announced in the last couple of days, McDonald's, Intuit, who makes QuickBooks and Quicken, has US Veterans Administration, Cox Media, Fujifilm, Toshiba. I mean, really there are more than can be listed, but these are happening today, yesterday, the day before, and they will not stop. So we all understand that. That's why you're attending this webinar. It's why I'm providing this information. Uh, so one takeaway is we have to make sure our security is multi-layered. And uh, the concepts of identifying where we are, preventing, detecting, responding, these are all important, and I'm gonna um, just dive into that a little more. So where do attacks come from? The uh, This isn't, completely current information, but I'm, I would believe that it's uh, still accurate in terms of rough percentages, that 42% of all attacks, successful attacks, come through email. So we've seen it, you get bad emails, I get bad emails. Um, and so email prevention is really critical. 21% uh, are server attacks and a smaller percentage, um, call it, 7% are PCs and laptops, and then there are other uh, methods of attack. So since the attack methods are varied, we basically wanna focus and make sure that we're doing our best to prevent attacks and uh, mitigate on the most commonly attacked elements. This is a display of the basic cybersecurity framework of the National Institute of uh, uh, Security this framework is the same in one form or another uh, by CMMC, the military certification, by HIPAA, the healthcare uh, certification. The concepts are the same. And uh, they categories of identify, meaning what do we have today? What's in place? Um, how secure are we? That starts with a security risk assessment, which we can help with if you haven't done one. Uh, protect, this is most of what we'll talk about today. How do we protect access control, both remotely and physically? Um, how do we make sure our employees are trained? How do we protect our data and other electronic assets? Um, what kind of maintenance is required? What kind of protective technology do we put in place? But then uh, another really important component in every one of these standards includes continuous security monitoring, which we do for clients. And uh, it's very important because sitting at my desktop as an end user, I have no idea if my PC is being pinged or if I have anything active going on. And that's true of uh, you as well, because there's no way to know that unless there is an outside resource, uh, an agent installed that is monitoring the status and uh, sending alerts. And so it's an important process. Um, then responding, this means if an attack takes place, or it might not be an attack, it could be a disaster or a tornado or a hurricane or fire, or it could be a ransomware attack. Do we have the processes in place to make sure that we know what to do? And that just doesn't mean uh, managers, it means all staff. And then are the, process, are the tools in place for recovery where we know that business continuity is assured? So those are the things we're gonna dive into just um, really specifically related to ransomware today. So an attack surface is a surface that is available to be attacked. And a surface includes perimeter data endpoints. Here's the list. So on the perimeter, that includes where the outside world can connect to us. So the internet is one place, which of course we might have 
tons of different internet connections. Wi-Fi, where um, we have networks that are electronically accessible, uh, any remote access, and it includes physical security as well. Uh, so we'll talk about the perimeter and how we protect. Then we must, uh, you know, obviously data is a big source of attack because the bad guys, they have more than one and they have varied interests and motivations, but a, a most common one for financial advantage is getting data and uh, stealing it, uh, encrypting it for ransom, uh, and there's protections we need to put in place. So our perimeter, our data, our endpoints, these are our desktops, our laptops, our Macs, uh, and to some degree, an iPad or so forth would be considered an endpoint. Um, they're just simply pretty darn secure, iPads. Um, so we need to protect remote workers and remote connections. We need to protect our email, our employees, Internet of Things, these are devices with internet access, our routers, TVs, cameras, thermostats, refrigerators, lab equipment, if you're in healthcare, uh, there's all kinds of lab equipment communicating to the outside world and so forth. These are the things where they're not being directly used as data devices, but they're really important. So we'll talk about how to protect them. And then really not an attack surface, but it is. We must have a disaster recovery plan. I use the word must, of course, uh, I, you should substitute probably strongly recommended. Um, and this simply means that we've really considered and prepared in advance for what might take place because awareness of our own security is important. So I'm going to dive into details on some of these areas. So our perimeter, the internet. So what does this mean protecting the internet? The first step is a firewall. And the reason for a firewall, a firewall consolidates all can, uh, communications into the building that come through our internet router. Without a firewall, the bad guys are sending pings out there to every IP address in the world, and each individual PC is being um, openly connected to our internet router through a switch, but pings can come directly to PCs. The most basic purpose of a firewall is to intercept every one of those, including outgoing traffic as well as incoming traffic, and make sure and uh, protect what it can in the first place. So the first thing is uh, we need to close all ports on a firewall that are not in use. And this is simple, it's inexpensive, it simply requires some expertise. So we want to configure the firewalls to require a remote desktop and VPN, or VPN uh, regardless of whether we're using remote desktop, but we need to make sure that we have a secured encrypted tunnel between every authorized outside uh, employee or other group. Uh, and we need to protect access as much as we can with two-factor authentication. And um, we need to set our firewalls to run silent. So this is a simple setting, but the basic out-of-the-box setting uh, isn't always this way, depending on the brand of firewall you use. And what this means is when those pings come in, you simply set your firewall to not respond. So when it's querying what version of Windows, what version of Windows Server, what version of Office, uh, there's simply no response given because that is uh, very relevant for one of the most important attack uh, weaknesses, which is unupdated security patches. So we just don't tell them what software we have. Uh, recommendations uh, have an account lockout policy. We do this for PBSI clients, but um, you, can, you can choose a different number, but to pre prevent access after three incorrect passwords, preventing mass password attacks. Um, then another setting, generally we turn this on for clients, uh, geo IP filtering, it simply starts with block all web traffic that doesn't come from the US, or then you start expanding, is Canada okay, and wh what other countries do you do business in? So um, these are settings that can be done in advance, they're settings that can be done in response to specific attacks, and we know where an attack comes from when, when uh, something happens. So it's easy for us to then block Romania or whatever. Uh, firewall software here is one level of multi-level um, defense where we have traffic being evaluated at the firewall level. So a $200, $200 firewall from Micro Center uh, might not have the availability for software, but most capable firewalls have the option. And we always install this software 
uh, that is actively doing antivirus checks and intrusion pre uh, prevention, getting real-time security updates, doing deep packet inspection, meaning it's looking inside the full content of every packet that comes in and out um, through the internet connection. And it's important protections. A lot of things are kept out of the building by an effective firewall that's doing the right thing software-wise. And then a basic thing, which is true of servers as well, we uh, always def disable the default admin account. Each vendor, whether SonicWall or a different vendor, uh, has a default admin account. And it could be the word admin or administrator, and then there's a default password. And you not only want to change the password, you actually want to disable it and give a different name to your administrator account. Um, the idea of misconfiguration is a really key thing. Um, I subscribe to a security uh, newsletter that identifies recent attacks, and uh, frequently, frequently, the large company attacks that have taken place, the source is identified as misconfiguration. So what does that mean? It means that the attack uh, could have been prevented, but the configuration of the security, whether it was the firewall or the server, uh, upsetting had not put in, been in, put in place so that the attack succeeded, even though the company had spent their money on the firewall or whatever. Uh, so um, this is the most basic setting change on all firewalls and servers. Okay, so we protect our internet connection and we keep as many uh, pings out of the building as we can, or buildings. Then Wi-Fi, uh, we want to use current technology. Here's something new uh, for most of you, including PBSI clients. Um, you may not have heard of Wi-Fi 6. It's a standard that was announced some time ago, but now devices are available, although they're in short supply. Uh, Wi-Fi 6 is uh, far more secure. It's faster, and it's quite inexpensive. The uh, firewalls, excuse me, the Wi-Fi access points, which are all mesh-capable, meaning that you can link them all together, uh, are either $99 or $179. So you could replace all of your access points quite inexpensively, and it's something worth doing. So ask for a quote. We're not going to uh, come after you and say, hey, do you want to buy something for $99? But um, this is an area where you can really improve your security with simple replacement of technology. For Wi-Fi, use a long password. And the reason for this is passwords can be hacked for Wi-Fi by simple proximity. So a vehicle can be in your parking lot, and if you have a short password, say six or seven characters or less, they can um, run software in their car, and within 10, 15 minutes, they have your password and can access your Wi-Fi. Um, simply going to 12 or more characters turns that into hours. Going to 20 characters turns it into days, and it's, you basically are completely safe. Now, I'm not suggesting this is is happening all over the place, but it's a setting. Um, and then Wi-Fi passwords, a lot of us haven't changed our Wi-Fi passwords in a long, long time, and that's okay, except for every former employee or family member, whoever's been given your current password, uh, creates a reportable security risk because you now have unauthorized people who do have uh, continued access to your network, so small thing. Uh, remote users, uh, this is an important part of our perimeter. We'll talk about those uh, specifically, individually. And physical access, I won't deal with today, but this means locking the places where our uh, servers or our data are stored, uh, physical sign-in logs, employee challenge procedure. Uh, do, do employees know what to do if a stranger is walking down the hallway and they don't have a badge on? Um, or do they just say, hmm, I don't recognize that person and go on with their business? Uh, electronic access control, badge readers, that kind of thing, uh, camera devices, these are all important. And we provide uh, these services, but I'm not going to focus on those today. All right, so our perimeter, starting point. Uh, secure our data. Of course, this is critical. This is where ransomware is the uh, most dangerous. So the first starting point of ransomware protection is using a piece of software designed for it, uh, and there's a category called Endpoint Detection Response, EDR. We use a product called Sentinel-1. It's the highest rated EDR on the market. It's uh, Sentinel-1 says you can't get ransomware a device protected by a Sentinel-1, period. You can't get ransomware. And we've never seen ransomware uh, attacks succeed on a device that we've protected with Sentinel-1. However, 
uh, how long will that be true? That's a big, bold claim that Sentinel-1 makes. I think it's really important and it's quite inexpensive to put Sentinel-1 in place. Uh, still, we have to prepare for the day where even though they've said it, somebody gets behind it and it fails. Um, but Sentinel-1 has this rollback button if a device does get infected without going to backup, we can push a button on your behalf and it undoes the attack to pre-infection state. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because uh, these are concepts that, I mean, we simply are time limited to delve into detail every place, but unupdated security patches are one of the uh, two most significant attack areas that cause a PC to be infected. Email is clearly the first, but uh, every time a vendor updates their security software. And I recently saw a list, Microsoft, uh, there's a link we could provide. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, Microsoft has provided like 150 different security patch updates, just Microsoft. And uh, think about that, the software that's been around a long time, how could it be they're still finding vulnerabilities and fixing them? But the basic fact is, it's true, they are, and those patches are important because when they release the patch, they release the information to the rest of the world, including the bad guys, that here's something that's been fixed and the bad guys are alerted, oh, hmm, if we create something that can do this, we can take advantage of that. Now all they need is access to your device. So your firewall protects access to your device. And um, even if something gets through the firewall, which it can, remember the zero day attacks, then uh, your updated software patch is your protection. So for PBSI clients where we do security monitoring, we make sure your patches are all up to date. Um, and regardless of who does it for you, I don't think you wanna leave this to each end user at their PC because patch updates fail. So it's important. Uh, vulnerability scanning and alert management, this is a part of online security monitoring and uh, highly recommended for any device because an end user just doesn't know. So we protect the data that's stored on um, PCs and servers. On servers, a couple of the keys, unique accounts for each employee. Don't allow your employees to share passwords. I know that there are some front desks and um, roles where it causes some operational issues to not share passwords, but still, if a password is shared among any number of employees and one of them has a compromised password, then you've now compromised all those employees and potentially the organization and, um, and you've eliminated the ability to audit activity uh, as well. So admin accounts change name and passwords. We talked about that, that needs to be done on servers as well. There are some group policy settings. Um, most organizations have a domain controller, which is a, piece of Windows Server uh, software, and we wanna make sure that account lockout is set for three or some small number of incorrect passwords, and that we have role-based settings. So you can set containers. A container is a group of, of privilege settings. So what, in what areas do they have admin access, if any place? And if we set a, for each staff role, we set a container, then new staff, members just get added into that container and so we can systematize access control for existing and new employees. And then uh, again, something we do for PBSI clients, if you tell us somebody has left, we, not, we don't just change their email password, we know what other actions to take on the firewall and uh, remote access connections uh, to their desktop and any other accounts. So. Uh, this is another area where misconfiguration can be the fault and commonly is because uh, there have been some highly publicized attacks where a former employee who hadn't used their uh, password for uh, years, in fact, this was the case with the SolarWinds attack. That's um, how it's first identified is that a former employee was, quote, trying to log in and somebody said, wait a minute here, and uh, but it hadn't been configured correctly. So. Um, backup. So this is our fail safe and uh, we recommend the enable backup software that we use because it's ransomware protected and whatever backup tool you use, you want to follow the 3-2-1 rule, at least three copies on at least two different media types with at least one copy 
offsite. And your onsite copy should be encrypted to prevent ransomware from being able to get to your onsite backup. Uh, the backup we use keeps each of the last 28 days and then we can archive longer. And having both a local copy and an online copy is important. And your online backup needs to be disconnected. So if you're a PBSI client, whenever an online backup is done each night, then as soon as the backup is complete, the connection between the server or PC is disconnected from the cloud so that anybody who uh, accesses your, if, if you were hacked, they couldn't get to your backup. And then use a separate unique password to access backups as opposed to those you've used in other server or network administration so that if somebody gets admin access to a device on your network, that doesn't give them admin access to your backups. So these are some principles that hopefully there's uh, some takeaway for everyone. Uh, desktops and laptops, we want antivirus or a step up would be EDR software on all end devices. There has to be a piece of software in place that's the last line of defense if something gets through. Uh, thing I'll mention for new PC deployment, um, PBSI clients forget this um, and it's a recurring uh, reason that uh, we end up doing audits for clients. When you get a new PC, whether you get it from your vendor like PBSI, <coughs> excuse me, or you get it at Micro Center, whatever, uh, make sure that your vendor, including PBSI, knows about it because unless we know about it, then we don't install the antivirus and malware protection. And there's no cost to transfer license from replaced device to new device. We just need to know about it. And that just ensures that the PCs you put in place in the last year are all still protected. Um, patch management, we've talked about this in the focuses end users. And we make sure patches are up to place. You want to, in place, uh, you want to make sure that vulnerability scans and alert, uh, alerts are being issued and that somebody's paying attention. That's basically what we do at PBSI. Uh, a recommendation, this has to do with individual PCs. Timeout settings. We recommend each device uh, never be put to sleep, so power never goes out. Uh, but instead, set your device to turn your screen off after 10 minutes or whatever, choose the time, and on PCs, uh, Windows 10 screensavers, there's a setting where you can say, require a password to wake up. This combination of turning the screen off and requiring the wake up password secures your PC from uh, other people in the office or the cleaning crew but leaving your device on all the time allows all the updates to take place when they're supposed to, and it avoids the Monday morning or when you turn your PC on, the, the computer is really slow because it's doing things it should have been doing uh, overnight. So, um, Local and remote access. When an employee leaves, these uh, need to be adjusted on the um, PC. So. Uh, and remove remote access software. We take on a new client and we find that uh, several of the PCs have a history and the history includes that employee installed um, whatever, go to my PC or whatever other software that they've used in the past and that software is installed and uh, remains there and, and that PC has uh, the ability for other people to access from the outside. So. We look for a splash top or whatever, and you want to make sure that you uh, do that with your PCs because it's like opening a hole or leaving a hole open in your network security. Uh, and again, online security monitoring for the PCs. Comment about PCs and backup. Uh, just a ton of people, organizations, have PCs that should be backed up, and, um, and they aren't. People store things on desktops, on their C drives. There's uh, more complexity in this conversation, but uh, recommendation here is to make each employee responsible to make sure the data they use is backed up. Most people just say, well, IT is handling that for me. I'm sure it's backed up. Well, really, if it's stored on your desktop, does IT, your support even know that? So um, distribute the responsibility to identify where data may be being used that's not backed up. And if you have PCs where stuff is stored, Put the same ransomware protected back up on those devices. Okay, remote connections. Um, remote connections can be the source and have been the source of many network infections because a home PC is taken over 
and passwords acquired, and that home PC then is uh, free to log into the network because it has all the access permissions, and now you've let a bad guy into your network just because the home PC wasn't protected. So that means making sure that each home user has adequate antivirus. Uh, we have a lot of clients where we supply the same antivirus on the home PCs and monitor them just like we do on work PCs. We do that at PBSI. Um, Windows, require Windows 10 or 11. Wait a minute, Windows 11? Yes, uh, thank you. Each of you listening to this webinar, you chose, probably without knowing it, to attend this webinar instead of the simultaneous announcement, 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time today, of uh, what we uh, believe to be Windows 11, new operating system release today. So I'll learn more about when this <laughs> webinar is over, and so will you. But you want current software, Windows 7 is security risk, uh, don't leave it in place. So I'm not gonna go through these all in detail, um, require remote connections using a VPN, uh, prohibit password saving on remote users' PCs, which uh, if you put it on your corporate domain, which we can help you do, you can prohibit that by electronics uh, as opposed to by policy, but don't let people save their login passwords on their home PCs. This makes the bad guy's job easier. Um, password reuse is a epidemic, and I won't talk more about it, but um, solve that impossible problem uh, and if you'd like, we've recently done our webinar just on password policy and password reuse, so feel free to ask for it. We'll send you a copy. Um, open ports on home PCs can be a danger. Internet of Things in homes can be a danger for the same reason that somebody's TV or their Wi-Fi at home is unprotected. Somebody takes advantage of that and uses that to access their PC, which uses that to access their network. So Internet of Things is the general category for all devices that are internet capable, but they aren't data devices. And uh, we can monitor home PCs if you'd like as well. All right, email. Most important topic here, uh, make sure, and if you're a PBSI client, you, you either have this installed or we've strongly recommended it to you, but 90-something um, percent of PBSI clients, we've made sure this is in place. The $2 a month click protection, Microsoft Defender for 365, which is not Windows Defender, the free Windows Defender that comes with every PC, this prevents click mistakes from causing problems. So when you click on something that's bad, you simply get a message saying that link was malicious or that attachment was malicious. And that prevents so many things that otherwise would cause a problem. And this is an important thing. We recommend requiring multi-factor authentication on your email. So this is one where if you're a PBSI client, you may or may not have this in place. We have not gone and made this a requirement for every client, but we recommend you turn it on. And the basic reason is an email can be compromised. So let's say a hack succeeds. And now the bad guy who's got that email wants to use it to send out an email to folks in your contact list. And when they try to do that, if you have multi-factor authentication turned on, the first thing that happens is when they try to log into your email, you get a message on your phone. It says, is it okay to allow this new connection from Jupiter, Florida? Oh, no. Multi-factor authentication prevents the successful use of a hacked email. Um, you can encrypt outgoing emails. Um, we can give more information to anybody who wishes, uh, setting transport rules and setting uh, things on your domain controller and employee messaging. We can help in all these areas, and generally we do these as defaults. Some of these are defaults, employee messaging may not, but uh, these are things you can do within email to help keep it secure. Uh, every email needs filtering. If you're using 365 or Exchange Online, that is uh, that does active filtering. And so if you're not using Microsoft's email, uh, make sure that you've got some kind of filtering going on that recognizes attack patterns and blocks what they can. They won't block bad emails. Um, or at least they won't block most or a lot of them, but um, they'll do a lot to prevent bad emails from getting to your inbox if they uh, can establish a pattern. So I don't share email addresses. I uh, don't use free consumer email systems. I know a lot of people do. It's not a 
it's simply that Gmail and the like don't have the advanced security settings to prevent some things that um, Microsoft does. So, and then another, uh, re you might consider restricting use of non-authorized browsers and file sharing platforms. So an employee decides they want to use Dropbox for something and they agree with three other employees that they're going to share these things on Dropbox. Management doesn't know about it. IT doesn't know about it. You can, uh, we can assist with this or do it for you. Set prohibitions such that uh, Box, Dropbox, whatever, the ones you don't use are prohibited. So if somebody tried to set one up, they would uh, encounter an error and they'd have to come to management or IT and it simply allows you to control where your data is stored. Okay. Uh, employee training is really critical. I almost want to use the word mandatory, but remember that the greatest percentage of email attacks come from, uh, or from uh, ransomware attacks come from email. And this statement, the number one way ransomware gets on a PC is with the unwitting assistance of the end user. That's a really important element. And the only solution is train users on social engineering tactics, meaning how to recognize bad emails and the kinds of tactics that change all the time. Uh, and the product we use at PBSI for our employees and we recommend is $3 a month per uh, employee. So it's not an expensive thing. It includes all kinds of training. You can do your HIPAA training, PCI, um, OSHA, just great content. It's the number one provider in the world and uh, I'm continually impressed with their products where we can do fish testing and ongoing regular training. And your training is auto-documented. So every employee who takes the video and answers the questions gets a certificate and you uh, confirm for any future auditor that you have done the training with every employee. Uh, Internet of Things, the basics are change default passwords and make sure your firmware is updated. So how do you update firmware? You have a ubiquity device or whatever it is, you go to the vendor's website and you search either firmware or updates. And uh, it will likely require you to register your device, but then uh, the, the updates will come automatically. And it's important because this is just like an unupdated security patch on a PC, except there's no firewall standing in the way. So the firmware update is your defense against a vulnerability being um, taken advantage of. Then uh, finally, disaster recovery. So this means business continuity plan uh, needs to be either created or updated and published. How are we protected in the event of? So you've thought through what prevents a tornado or a ransomware or what's, and so you have policies you've carefully thought about. Then what happens in an incident? Uh, how do we report an incident? Uh, who coordinates this? What's the sequence of events? What's the contact pattern? Uh, basically, you need to clearly establish roles and everybody needs to know what they are and you must decide in advance. This will never be an urgent issue. How many people listening say, yeah, I know we've meant to do that. I know we need to do that. And yet uh, today and tomorrow you still won't do it. And next month you still won't have it done. Uh, I speak not critically. <laughs> I understand human nature, we're all busy. Um, but unless you decide and put this on your list, we can help with this. We have templates and um, help with the review policy, but however you do it, uh, have a plan in place. In some cases, that's a requirement. It's a requirement for HIPAA. It's a requirement for any certification to have a plan in place. And then a lot of people still, they say, well, yeah, we kind of have one and go on from there. So other back practices, two-factor authentication on other apps other than just email. Restrict users' permissions to install and run desktop applications. This is not something we do as a default, but that requires um, something beyond, somebody tries to install software and they're blocked from doing it. It says contact IT or contact your manager. Uh, limit access privileges. This is not generally attended to well, and it's all about deciding in advance and setting privileges um, that are applied as standards. Make sure your remote protocols are secure, uh, clean up your domain control. This has to do with misconfiguration. Old non-needed network shares, old folder permissions, old employees who still have uh, access. Um, limiting permissions to cloud shares, blacklisting and whitelisting both applications and attachment types. 
uh, you might consider an ad blocker. I use one on my PC. I use a uh, uBlock Origin. And it causes issues at times where I'm, tr I'm trying to do something that's perfectly legitimate and it says, uh, you know, this, I have to touch a button to allow access to the site and it's a little pain. But on the other hand, it blocks all kinds of things that never reach me uh, and ads that otherwise would pop up. So that's not a requirement, simply an idea. And then uh, for those with complex networks, segment them, build individual virtual networks within your network so that if a user doesn't need access to a certain set of data in the organization, it basically doesn't exist for them because it's on a separate network. These are all ideas. And any PBSI client, ask us questions, come to us uh, if you want more information or how to do this or whether you want us to do this for you. So we're finished with content. Our summary, uh, protect your perimeter with firewall and home connections, protect your data, basically with endpoint detection and response ransomware prevention and make sure that you have backup that is tested and protected. Uh, protect your endpoints, train your employees, make sure other network devices uh, are in place and that you're doing uh, security monitoring, whether by PBSI or some other source. It's an uh, important element. So. I want to thank you for your attendance. I ran a little over today. We really like to hold these webinars to 30 minutes. And um, obviously, I couldn't complete the content or didn't complete the content in time. But uh, I want to thank you for your attendance. We're finished. <laughs>